Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today, guess who recorded a video and did all of these things and it turned out the microphone was off? This guy. Um, so I, I've recorded some of it again and this is the intro that you're getting instead of the really interesting intro that I had done that I guarantee you had jokes and was really engaging. Anyway, on with the video. Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And you can tell from the fact that this is not my usual layout what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the Malazan series. Now, the first half of this video is going to be spoiler free. The second half of the video uh, has some spoilers in it and that's really where I want to go to talk about a lot of this stuff. But I want to establish a baseline and I want to talk through when we talk about the Malazan books, what we mean by series and all of this sort of stuff. So as you can see on the screen now, this is the Malazan series because these are the Malazan books of the Fallen, the 10 book series by Stephen Erickson and the novels of the Malazan Empire by Ian C. Esselman. Now, I know a lot of people refer to Stephen Erickson's series as the main series. To my mind, that that's an incorrect attribution. This is the main series. Ian C. Esselman, Stephen Erickson together created this, uh, this 16 book series. We also have to address the fact that when people think about series, they tend to think in terms of a sequence of chronological events following a specific group and those events are all causally linked and the group moves through them roughly chronologically. That's not necessarily what series means. Series is an interconnected set of narratives. And in this instance, these 16 books are interwoven. They encompass the, this grand world shaping event at a certain place in the history of this world. So together they form, to my mind, the Malazan series, the main series. Now that is clearly subdivided into two separate distinct series or sub-series, The Malazan Book of the Fallen by Stephen Erickson and The Novels of the Malazan Empire by Ian C. Esselman. I don't regard either one as more supreme or uh, more important than the other. These are two co-equal series within the main series. Additional to all of this are, of course, the prequel novels, the novels are the Path to Ascendancy novels by Ian C. Esselman, the sequel novels, um, The Witness Trilogy by Stephen Erickson, the prequel novels, The Carcanus Trilogy by Stephen Erickson. And then there's a set of novellas, which are the Balk Lane and Corporal Brooch novellas by Stephen Erickson. Those things are outside of the main series. The sequels clearly are dependent on, but are set at a different time, they involve different characters and they make reference to the stuff that happens here uh, in terms of the history of the world that they are building from. The prequel trilogy is again something that this main series came out of, but the prequel trilogy is something separate. The Path to Ascendancy is a very focused series building up toward uh, Night of Knives and, and Gardens of the Moon, that that's where it's heading towards. It's heading towards that um, sort of start to both of these sets of books. So those things are all outside of the main series and the main series is this thing. So that, those are just my thoughts on it uh, starting out. But sometimes looking at this, given that these are, for the most part are big junky books, this can be overwhelming for some people going, oh, if I start this, I'm gonna have to read all of them. And for the most part, Almost every single one of these books is a relatively self-contained volume, that it has a, uh, a conclusion to it that provides closure for the events of that novel. Do you gain a greater understanding if it is read in context? Yes, yes you do. Is it harder to just jump in at any point in the series? Yes, yes it is. Even for a very straightforward um, and easily understood series, like something like the Dresden Files, where the early books are almost like case files, where here is the new case. If you jump in in the middle 
of the Dresden Files, that would be confusing because you don't know who a lot of the characters are, even though there are usually brief introductions. And that, in comparison to this, doesn't have the same level of complexity. And you can see why just jumping into the middle of this would then be very, very complicated. These are 16 books that interweave characters, stories, story arcs, character arcs, themes, motifs, settings, and are all operating in the same world, covering the same period of time. So there's a lot of overlap. Events in one book can have repercussions or ramifications for other books. So there's a lot of interrelationship here. So to break it down, let's have a look at The Malazan Book of the Fallen by Stephen Erickson. 10 book series. So this is slightly more manageable than 16. Um, begins with Gardens of the Moon, then Dead House Gates, then Memories of Ice, House of Chains, Midnight Tides, The Bone Hunters, Reaper's Gale, Toll the Hounds, and then the, the last two, which Erickson has always described as one novel split into two, Dust of Dreams and The Crippled God. I think Erickson sometimes over uh, oversimplifies this because while it may have been the intent when he was writing i would guess that dust of dreams and the crippled god what was happening there was going to be in one volume dust of dreams and the crippled god aren't really structured as it's simply one novel split in two um, there is a conclusion to dust of dreams so it reads as a novel even though it doesn't answer the questions raised by the novel. Uh, it answers some of them. So it, it's ending on a cliffhanger. Um, so it operates really as almost as a geology, but more on that later. But those are the, the 10 books of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Um, simple, straightforward. That is one of the sub-series in the main Malazan series. Then we have the novels of the Malazan Empire. Now, Night of Knives, uh, is actually quite short. It's on just over novella length. It gets a, it's a short novel. Um, then we have Return of the Crimson Guard, Stone Wielder, Orb Scepter Throne, Blood and Bone, and A Seal. And the thing is, you can read the Malazan Book of the Fallen series by Stephen Erickson, books one to ten, and read it and get a satisfying series. You can read the novels of the Malazan Empire by Ian C. Esselman, from Night of Knives to A Seal, and that is a satisfying series. You can intermix them with various chronologies. You can intermix them in terms of publication date. You can read them all together. There are so many different ways of approaching this, but the easiest way and the way that both authors have recommended at various stages is to read them in publication order. So when we look at it in publication order, Gardens of the Moon, Dead House Gates, Memories of Ice, House of Chains, Midnight Tides, the first five books of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Then we have Night of Knives by Ian C. Asimov. So we start with five Stephen Erickson books and then we move on to Night of Knives by Ian C. Asimov. Then Stephen Erickson's The Bone Hunters and Reaper's Gale. Then back to Asimov for Return of the Crimson Guard. Then Toll the Hounds and Dust of Dreams by Stephen Erickson. Then back to Esselmont for Stonewielder. Back to Erickson for The Crippled God. And then we finish out with Esselmont's Orb Scepter Throne, Blood and Bone, and The Seal. This was the order they were published. Now, there may be uh, people who have already read the series going, but don't do that. Oh, the, I'll tell you a better way to do it. One of the reasons why authors suggest this and bear in mind it is a suggestion it is not an order it's not a directive it is simply a suggestion is because when they were writing these books they knew what readers had been told up to that point in the publication history so when erickson was publishing gardens of the moon no one knew anything and so gardens of the moon he knew readers would be going in fresh whether or not you appreciate that he decided to tell the story from media res, that he chose the style that he did, that didn't emphasize a lot of explanatory exposition or setting things up in a standard format and introducing concepts very slowly to the reader to build them up over time. He kind of 
throws us in at the deep end and expects us to swim. You may or may not like that style, but Ericsson did that knowing that no one knew the world. And he thought, and it was his intention, that everything in that book was enough for the reader to get what he was trying to do with the book. The same with Dead House Gates, the same with Memories of Ice, the same with House of Chains and Midnight Tines. Each time he was writing one of these books, he was aware of what was publicly available to the reader, what the reader was aware of, what they knew. And therefore, that's why the books are partly written in the way that they are. Things are revealed as and when he believed was the best place, the best time to reveal or explain those aspects to a reader. As soon as you start messing around with publication data, you start changing that. Because there'll be people out there who will tell you, oh, I have a different order. And the thing is, my own personal preference is actually slightly different to this. And we'll go through that at the end, but it's going to be in the spoiler section. Because I, I'm going to explain a wee bit about why. But as soon as you start moving things around, the information may occur chronologically or sequentially in a neater place, but the method and the style with which it has been relayed to the reader is presupposing the reader already has certain experiences. And therefore, even though, and quite often it's re-readers do this, they go, oh, put that there, that will make much more sense. We are influenced by the fact that we already know what the context is. And it's actually quite difficult to think about what a new reader will know coming up to that point. And so I would suggest, again, not saying anyone has to do this, but I would suggest that following this order makes the most sense, is closest to the experience that both authors wanted the reader to have, and it's the easiest one to maintain because you just look at when was this book first published, right? That's, that's the next one I will read then because publication order, simple and it's straightforward. So you can either read each of the, the sub-series separately, Last Book of the Fallen, Novels of the Empire, going from first to last, or you can integrate them in publication order, which is how both authors thought that people would read the books. And that's why they are structured the way that they are, narrated the way that they are, and information is revealed the way that it is. So I'm about to move into some spoiler talk. But before I do that, before I move into to spoilers, well, it depends on people's definition of spoiler now, does it? <sighs> I'm going to talk about the relationship between some of the books, some, some structural stuff. And to be perfectly honest, if you're worried about, I'm not going to go into plot points. I'm not going to go into a lot of the character points. I'm going to talk about the relationship between books and how they um, move between various storylines. If you don't want to know that, thank you very much for watching up until this point. If you're okay with that, because I'm not going into any details, then let's get started. So, when we think about this, the first book published was Gardens of the Moon. And the next book was Dead House Gates. And there's a, quite a, a famous story that when Erickson had finished Gardens of the Moon, he started writing Memories of Ice and had a computer malfunction and lost the manuscript up until that point, couldn't recover it. Being slightly disheartened and frustrated, he decided to start Dead House Gates and he wrote Dead House Gates. And that's why Dead House Gates is the second book. Um, a lot of fans, after they have read the series, will say, well, you could read Memories of Ice immediately after Gardens of the Moon. And part of the reason for that is this. Gardens of the Moon and Memories of Ice work as a duology. Book one and book two of a two-book miniseries. The introduction to the, the concepts, the conclusion of the concepts. It is a concrete story arc. It fits book one to book two, or well, in this case, book three, because Memories of Ice is book three. But it works as a geology. And interestingly, then you start Dead House Gates. And Dead House Gates is a 
it's it's a connected story, but it is set in a, mostly in a different place with different characters and with a different focus. So it feels quite separate. And in fact, it connects as a duology to House of Chains, where that storyline is concluded. So the first four books actually form two duologies. And then you have the fifth book, Midnight Tides. Midnight Tides forms a duology with the seventh book, Reaper's Gale. And then we have the Bone Hunters. And people say, ah, oh, the Bone Hunters, this is, this is where it all falls down. Well, actually, the Bone Hunters is part of a trilogy with Dust of Dreams and the Crippled God. And curious enough about this, Dust of Dreams and the Crippled God, as they were originally envisaged when Erickson was thinking about how the series was going to conclude, when he had mapped out a lot of these things in his head, he had thought of Dust of Dreams and the Crippled God as a single volume, a, a large novel, yes, but a single volume. So the original structural plan had Bone Hunters to Dust of the Crippled God's Dreams, or something like, I'm sure he would have come up with a better title, but it would have again been another duology with Bone Hunters concluding in Dust of Dreams of the Crippled God, single volume. Which means that Toll the Hounds is the only one that doesn't have an obvious companion piece. And there are actually there are two ways to think about this. One is Toll the Hounds is the final conclusion of an aspect of Gardens of the Moon. It fits and closes out the end of Gardens of the Moon completely. The other way of thinking about it, out of left field, an Esselmont book, Orb, Scepter, Throne. Toll the Hounds and Orb, Scepter, Throne work as a duology. The Hound sets up a whole sequence of events, Orb, Scepter, Throne, closes them down and finalizes them. And they actually work quite well as a duology, which is fun because there's this one Esselmont book that really fits with this structure of duologies in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. And then when we look at the structure of the novels of the Malazan Empire, Knight of Knives, Return of the Crimson Guard, Stone Wielder, Orb Scepter Throne, Blood and Bone, A Seal. There is a flow and a sequence to all of these books. Each, again, a self-contained novel, much more so actually than, um, than Erickson's volumes. But there are continuing threads. There are continuing character arcs. There are developments. But interestingly, again, that this Toll the Hounds pairing with Orb Scepter Throne can disrupt it that it can be added in if you were just going to read the novels of the Malazan Empire, that Knight of Knives, Turn of the Crimson Guard, Stone Wielder, Toll the Hounds then sets up what happens in Orb Scepter Throne. That's the only one in this sequence that really requires knowledge from the other series. So it's interesting that of the two sub-series within the main series of the Malazan books, it's only Toll the Hounds and Orb Scepter Throne that really work well together in a pairing, that they, they flow from each other's narrative. Now, there is um, this, this diagram. I'm sure some of you have seen this. Uh, and it was initially, uh, initially devised by Drek from the Malazan Empire Forum. And it has now been updated by Iteralda, uh, to incorporate some of the newer books. And I got this from the Malazan fandom wiki. But it's just to show there are these complex ways that you can read and reread and move through the series. And this is one of the ways to do it. Um, there's a whole diagram, there's explanatory notes. It helps you map out your reading journey if this is the kind of thing that you want to do. Personally, Schematics like that make me uncomfortable. So this is how I would structure it if I was rereading just this, the main Malazan sequence. 
Knight of Knives as the prequel, as this is setting up, this is the, the pebble that starts the ball rolling, that starts the whole avalanche. Knight of Knives, because it's Kelmved and Dancer ascending. What caused that to happen? Gardens of the Moon, setting up the key elements with um, the parents, the bridge burners, the Rujistan, all of those elements. And then slowly working through again to Midnight Tides, Bone Hunters, Reaper's Guild. And it's only at Reaper's Guild then where I bring in Return of the Crimson Guard. And that's Gardens of the Moon, Dead House Gates, Memories of Ice, House of Chains. There's your two duologies at the start that give you those nice narrative units at the beginning. Then Midnight Tides setting up the next thing, Bone Hunters setting up the next thing, including Midnight Tides with Reaper's Gale. So now we have the one piece in motion is the conclusion of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. But in order to get the full ramifications of that, we take a step back in time to the Return of the Crimson Guard, Stonewielder. But that then sets up what is happening in the world. It gives depth and understanding to it. And in particular, the themes explored in Stonewielder really speak to a lot of the things that happen in Toll the Hounds. Then Toll the Hounds paired with Orb, Scepter, Throne, the way that I'd already discussed. And then when we finish Orb, Scepter, Throne, Blood and Bone is this wonderful moment, very self-contained, post-colonial sort of uh, heart of darkness story. But it brings everything up to the present, to the moments that are going to happen. Fact, slightly past it but then that's where you go take a little half step back to dust of dreams and the crippled god and then we conclude everything with a sale that a journey begun with kelenved and dancer and their night of ascension ends with the events in a sale and that is that's kind of how i feel about the story so it is very much well, for the most part, following that publication um, sequence that Erickson and Esselman think is one of the best ways to read the works. I like integrating them because we get this movement about the things that are happening in the world and we get different perspectives on characters. Things, uh, characters introduced in one novel appear in another novel. References to events. The Crimson Guard from Gardens of the Moon, their mention and, and appearance, we see them and spend time with them in Return of the Crimson Guard. But it's not dependent on them. It's not that you need to know immediately what happened to them, that there's no need to have that really early on in the sequence. And so that's kind of why I structured it this way. Now, I admit there are going to be people who are going to look at this and go, that makes no sense whatsoever. But this is how it kind of makes sense in my head. So while I'm aware of that sort of leapfrogging that we do, the, the fact that I'm, I'm not putting the duologies together, it's, I'm aware of that because I think of it as very much like the point of view chapters in a book where we are moving through these things where we are establishing baselines, where we're seeing what this character is doing. And then sometimes we have to take a step back in time to see what other characters are doing. Then when we get to the end of that book and we go to the next one in the sequence, there might be, oh, these other characters are going to be important for the things that are going on. And that then requires new characters being introduced. So that's why I have it kind of structured this way. In my head, this is how a lot of my thoughts about the series, it comes from this kind of structure. I know that some people think that um, ending with the Cripple God is the, the best way to do it. I think some of the themes in a seal tie in really neatly and very nicely with the whole series, that the Cripple God is an excellent end to the Malazan Book of the Fallen, and a seal is an excellent end to the novels of the Malazan Empire. But of the two, I actually quite like a seal's ending as an ending to this main sequence. But anyway... These are just my thoughts on this. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support and I'll see you in the next one.